So Audrey is a 2019 Tory Burch Foundation Fellow um, and the founder and CEO of Mariana Strategies, um, a workplace culture and consulting firm with offices in DC and Chicago. Audrey works with organizations to create healthy and inclusive workplace cultures um, from preventing workplace harassment to cultivating um, the emotional intelligence of teams. Um, an employment lawyer and certified change management practitioner um, who I, we know Audrey speaks and writes frequently on issues of workplace uh, equity and inclusion. So I guess all that to say, we are in incredible hands for today's session. Um, and we are just so thrilled that Audrey is going to be talking to all of us here about how to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a really essential part of our company's culture and strategy. Um, so for today, um, we are going to have lots of time for Q&A at the end. So um, please use the Q&A box for your questions. We wanna make sure we can find them all and see everybody's questions. Um, for all of the, um, the energetic support, the community building, please use the chat. Um, and that's really a place for us all to uh, cultivate community. Um, so, um, and just one, one quick note for everybody, um, watch your inboxes later today. We'll of course have a, a replay link so you can, you know, if you miss something, um, you know, no need to, to go back a slide, you'll be able to catch up later. Um, and also take that post webinar survey because it'll help us develop some new programming for you all. And I think a lot of great stuff will come out of today. So enough of me, Audrey, I wanna pass it over to you and I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Molly. So you're here today because you are thinking about what it takes to make diversity, equity, inclusion an essential part of your company's culture and your strategy. And I want to start with a really simple example. You know, something that we do in my work when, when we're working with a, a group is, you know, we'll ask people, what's something that has changed? since you began your career. Whether you started your first job six months ago or you've been in, in the working world for 30 years, the most common thing that we hear is that it, it's a more inclusive place than it used to be. Um, it, that, that is far and away the most common answer that we hear, uh, even more than technology. And wow, look at where we are today and what we're doing today, how we make uh, webinars like this possible and remote work possible, even then people say inclusion is, is the biggest change. And I wanna give you a personal example. Uh, when I started my career, I was a lawyer in New York City and I was one of only two women who were attorneys at the firm. And you can be sure that the support staff was mostly female, uh, but two attorneys at the firm. And I didn't know how to talk about things happening outside of the workplace that were affecting my life. And they had a big effect because at the time, my mom was very sick. She was in a nursing home. I was in my mid twenties and I didn't know or have the framework to talk about how that affected my life, how I needed to spend time with my mom as she was sick. But that wasn't a part of what inclusion meant at the time in the workplace, didn't have role models to talk about it didn't have webinars like this to find out about what made a workplace inclusive. And what happens and what that looks like is that there was a part of me I couldn't bring to work. And it was hard because we know that when we're talking about inclusion in the workplace, we're talking about a sense of being able to be your true authentic self. And my authentic self needed to be with my mom sometimes on a Sunday afternoon and not working around the clock in litigation. And so that's a thing that I bring to work now. Uh, it, at my workplace, we're able to talk about our childcare commitments, our family issues, certainly about how health affects us in the workplace and making that space to be able to talk about something as simple as, whoops, my kid's class is now being sent home because of COVID uh, is something that has been a tremendous change that goes directly to issues of inclusion in the workplace. So I start with that example because I think a lot of us have the experience of having been uh, one of the only in, in a workplace. And 
that's the thing that once you're able to be your authentic self in the workplace, people understand you, who you are, you never want to go back. And that's, that's what we're here to talk about today. So what, you know, what does this look like in practice, right? What this looks like in practice are, are some of these headlines. You know, the standards are changing um, for what we'll settle for in the workplace. Um, and when you are going out and looking to recruit and retain excellence, people are looking to work in places where they can thrive. I am sure you've seen headlines recently that say the great resignation wasn't just about people resigning. It was more like a great game of musical chairs. People wanted something better than what they were putting up with before and during the pandemic. And that means for businesses, showing that we are a place that's inclusive, uh, that's diverse, and where people can thrive. And these are just some of the headlines. Now, you know, we can continue that. Whose responsibility is it to create that workspace? Well, the buck stops with you. You have a business imperative to get this right. On issues big and small, you need to have a compass that steers you right when it comes to achieving outcomes on diversity and equity and inclusion, right? So in, in our years uh, at Mariana Strategies of DEI consulting work, we've seen a pattern um, that aligns with decades of issues that have plagued this work in corporate America an unwillingness to make this a real priority. And there are a number of reasons. Uh, for some leaders, it's a lack of understanding about the true importance of it, its work. Um, for others, it's not knowing where to begin, right? And for some people, it's a fear of making mistakes, right? Uh, when we're in a leadership position, it can be a frightening thing to show vulnerability, not having all the answers, right? And for some, some leaders are not able to make a personal connection to the work, instead assuming that DEI issues are for human resources or employee resource groups or only their minority employees. And there are problems with this kind of thinking. Most importantly, that DEI goals can't be achieved without leadership taking the initiative seriously and doing the hard work to listen to employees, to engage in self-reflection, and to take the necessary steps to transform or create an organization's culture into one that truly supports DEI. So, you know, we have some examples up here on, on the screen. Um, for instance, the one that says, imagine you're a hospital administrator and you've recently hired a new physician with a quote, I would say, um, unusual to you name, uh, Adeze Adebayo Okoyemi but she offers both you and her patients a seemingly easy option. Just call me Dr. Daisy, she says cheerfully. Do you? And I'd ask everyone here, what do you do? Now, my question isn't, what have you done in the past? The question is, what's the right thing to do here? And what we do and what we suggest is that we learn how to pronounce Dr. Adebayo Okayemi's name. It's a part of respect in the workplace. That's just one very simple example. But as leaders, it's important that we are the ones doing the work. The other headline we've shared here from the New York Times, um, their bosses asked them to lead diversity reviews. Guess why? Ooh, this goes to the question of whose work is it to do diversity, equity, and inclusion? And if the answer in other organizations in the past uh, for us otherwise, looking backwards was it's the work of people who fall into minority categories, that's not the answer now. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we do, I want us to, to have an apples to apples uh, discussion about what we're talking about when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'd ask you, why is it important to have shared definitions and shared language, 
right? If I think diversity means one thing and you think it means another, we'll be measuring two different things. So very quickly, I want us to talk about what these things mean. First, when we're talking about diversity, representation. Um, and that will mean different things in different workplaces. A range of identities, right? Uh, and some will be more important uh, in some workplaces than in others, right? Uh, for instance, for some of our clients um, who do work in international development, uh, what is important for diversity can mean representation in the work that they're doing on the ground in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, for our uh, clients who work in hospitality in, in Washington, DC, it's a different question. Uh, it can be specific, but it definitely means uh, representation of the communities we seek to serve. Next is inclusion. It's a feeling of being respected, being valued for your uniqueness and a sense of belonging, right? We know it when we feel it in the workplace. And finally, sense of what equity means. It's fairness, impartiality, and adjusting to address unfairness. And we give uh, one example here of pay equity. Okay. So when we're looking at these questions, we want to be thinking about how are each of these topics defined and implemented in the workplace. So from here and for the rest of uh, the time that you're gonna be hearing me speak, we're gonna be talking about what we think at Mariana Strategies are the most important takeaways for leaders in creating an inclusive culture. So first, item number one, and from a principle of change management, I think this might be the most important thing, it has to do with your leadership. Your leadership has to show that creating a healthy, inclusive culture takes all of us and an inclusive culture means exactly that. A culture that includes everyone. It's not for some of us, it's not by some of us. It means all of us, right? Acknowledging and understanding our various identities, how power and privilege affect us at work, right? It includes a holistic approach to preventing harm and creating accountability, right? And that leaders have to lay the foundation for creating that culture. Uh, like I mentioned a moment ago about change management, your efforts within an organization to create greater diversity and inclusion and equity will not be successful unless it comes from the top. And it's uh, insistence on being implemented comes from the top, okay? Now that goes to the organizational values that engender and reinforce these goals. Now to to bring the point home about uh, inclusion taking all of us, I'd like to, to share this wheel of power and privilege from Sylvia Duckworth. Now, building an inclusive culture can feel like putting together a puzzle. And that means you need all the pieces, not just some of them. So when we talk about the role of power and privilege, we're asking our clients, we're asking organizations to dig deep. Some, some folks are thinking about various parts of their identity very regularly, right? Like I mentioned earlier about being one of the only in the workplace. It might be brought up for you, right? But for others, various identities are not always salient, right? And individuals might be confronting them for the first time in DEI work. No matter, everyone has something important to contribute in the workplace. Every person's unique perspective is essential to building an inclusive workplace. Okay. So this is challenging work. Um, individuals who are closer to the center of the wheel of power have the opportunity to be an ally to individuals who may feel marginalized. Okay. Uh, there is the greatest opportunity to learn about experiences that are different from our own and nothing about the experience of having privilege makes someone a bad person. Now, saying something like that, it's, uh, that, that's not the uh, 
item that will get retweeted saying something uh, as uncontroversial as everyone should be part of this process. But that's another aspect of building a diverse, equitable and inclusive workplace uh, is that some of this work is really mundane. Some of it is profound, but for many instances, it will be something that, that says we truly need everyone and everyone's engagement. So let's talk about the next takeaway. DEI work is personal. It's important to have multiple perspectives on culture, policies, and practices. Yeah, you've probably heard the phrase, nothing about us without us, right? So it's important not to have someone else come in and tell you what you need. And at the same time, as a leadership within an organization, one individual alone can't determine what's best for an entire organization when it comes to equity and inclusion and diversity. When you're contemplating this work, we have to start by including everyone's voice from the outset. So assessing a situation, for instance, can mean simply listening, seeking to understand from employees what has been achieved in creating an equitable, inclusive, and diverse workplace, and what work still needs to be done. You can ask questions about the most important issues that are related to equity and inclusion and diversity in the workplace. Equity, are people paid fairly? Uh, do we provide salary bans and information about how people are paid within the workplace? Um, policies on leave or flexible work, how are they implemented? Who's affected by them? What are the needs? Do people feel safe to speak up? in the workplace. Uh, we'll share with you afterwards uh, resources that can be used in your workplace right now that are available on the internet to implement, uh, to ask people on your teams, what do we need when it comes to these questions? The next takeaway, you have to lay the right foundation. And if you're already well underway, then we wanna audit our existing practices. Right? Uh, it's crucial for us to be able to say, I understand that uh, we need a policy that creates uh, a workplace that's fair to caregivers, that allows caregivers to both do their, their work in the workplace and have uh, be able to take care of their, their family personal obligation outside of the workplace. But do we do that in practice? Now, some of this is related to work um, around preventing discrimination, preventing harassment in the workplace. And the greatest way that you can show inclusion is to ensure that if you have policies that say people will be held accountable for misbehavior, that we actually hold them accountable. And that goes to the next point, which is delivering an accountability. Now, accountability obviously is personal. I can't hold someone else accountable. But it does take actual people to be able to implement systems and processes within the workplace, right? So that can mean ensuring that we have strong policies on supporting our individuals within the workplace, um, but then also creating a system of accountability means holding yourself, your teams, and your organization as a whole accountable, right? Now, that means defining clearly communicating specific, measurable, and time-bound goals. In that situation, it's really important to listen to our workforce. I mentioned a moment ago conducting an audit of our policies and procedures and identifying shortcomings, discrepancies around inclusion based on the information that we have talked about, right? Figuring out what measurable changes can be made and committing to those priorities that have been identified by employees. Now, this is, I'm sure everyone here has worked in a workplace where uh, you've heard from leadership that something is a priority. And then six months later, a year later, you're never hearing about it again. Now, 
that's not a great way to build trust. And on issues that we see uh, in the news about how trust can be destroyed within organizations, uh, I can think of a few examples from just this week um, in the news. It's really important to deliver with transparency the work that we need to do in the workplace. So from there, measuring our progress, revisiting goals, monthly, quarterly, whatever's right for your organization, looking at the data and identifying gaps, places where you're making strides versus those that need more attention. And then we have to communicate to stakeholders. Now, your stakeholders can be a variety of people. It's for sure, it's your workforce. Uh, it might be a board of directors, it might be the community that you're working with or within. And all of those people have a role to play in your progress. And certainly it's important for you to communicate with them about the work that you're doing. The next point, communicate. Did I already say that? Do it again. This is important work. And if you're going to bother to ask employees their opinion, they will be looking to find out what you're doing about it. So it's important to be transparent from the start, letting them know you've heard their concerns, the goals you've chosen, and why, how you plan to measure progress, and then celebrate your successes and continue to collaborate on pushing the needle forward, right? So uh, I, I'm sure you've heard the, the phrase in marketing, um, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them. Uh, it's important to reiterate and use multiple channels to talk about the work that you're doing when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some people might be listening one day, not listening the next, miss a meeting, miss an email. Uh, so you might think you're over communicating, but until people come back to you and say, enough already, we know that we've met the mark on our um, survey results that show that people feel a sense of um, safety in being their authentic selves in the workplace. That's when you can say, all right, I'll take the afternoon off, right? But then you come back to it the next day. <laughs> now you can do this. This is work that uh, if you take away certain um, ideas from this discussion today, I think one of the most important ones is that diversity, equity, and inclusion work is much closer to your strategic planning than it is to um, like one-off uh, events or something that happens in a silo. Because like we're talking about here, it affects so many aspects of the workplace. Now, I, I'm gonna pull my screen down for just a second um, because you don't need to be looking at that for me to, to say this. I wanna talk a little bit more about inclusion. And we're gonna get in just a moment to talking about how we make meetings inclusive uh, and how we make meetings shorter. So I know there are some folks who will appreciate that. But when we're talking about inclusion in the workplace, now I've talked to you about policies, processes, transparency, accountability. All of those things are important. One thing we haven't talked about yet really deeply is culture. And I wanna be able to share with you some of the most important things that we've learned in talking with people about culture in the workplace. And uh, kind of, and where the, the research comes from on this. So my work started Mariana Strategies right after the Me Too movement exploded. And I, I gave my notice at the, the nonprofit I was working at and said, I am going to start an organization where I can help people feel safe at work. And we're going to start by tackling issues of harassment. And what the research shows is that when people feel respected at work, and when they know that the expectation is to behave respectfully towards others, harassment is less of a problem. It turns out that harassment is not just less of a problem, but there are other benefits that occur as well. People stay, right? So there's less of a retention issue. People feel more productive. They feel more engaged. They want to be at work. And that connects really closely to a sense of inclusion. 
And the work that I'm talking about right now is founded on uh, Christine Porath's research. Um, she's at Georgetown University, um, and she's written a number of great articles and books on this, um, one being The Price of Incivility. So I recommend looking at Christine Porath's work. But let's talk about inclusion and how preventing harassment, building respect, and inclusion are all connected and how you can implement that right now. Some of the most important things you can do. Now, when we talk about a feeling of inclusion, it's a little bit different from a feeling of, it's a lot different from a feeling of exclusion, but different in, in that for the feeling of exclusion, oh, it's, it's sharp, it's salient for people. People remember what, what they were wearing at the time, what room they were in, what, it, what they had for lunch that day. It's such a strong feeling, that sense of exclusion. But when you ask people what a sense of inclusion is like, they say things like, it, it just kind of feels good. <laughs> so it can be harder to pull apart and find out, okay, so what do you need me to do to make you feel included? And it turns out that the social scientists were able to pull that data and, and shows there are three really important things. First is a sense of being valued, right? So we're in the workplace, we're not fungible, right? I'm not just pressing out widgets and someone else could come in and do this work, right? I'm, I'm here for my uniqueness, right? Um, my contributions are valued. The next thing is talking about feeling trusted, right? And the opposite of trust is micromanagement. So in workplaces where people feel trusted to do the job they were hired to do, um, they feel a great sense of inclusion. And finally, the ability to feel safe being one's authentic self. Now, that can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different workplaces, uh, from issues of being able to talk about the impact of being uh, autistic, in the workplace and how my experience might be different from someone who is not neurodivergent in the workplace uh, to all kinds of other aspects of who we are, right? Now, this is an important distinguished, um, an important element to distinguish from the idea of assimilation into the workplace. Now, the example I gave you earlier from the very beginning of my working career in a law firm that uh, was mostly filled with older white men, uh, I didn't know how to assimilate into that. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do to be like them. I knew I could work hard, put my head down um, and write briefs, but how could I be the person who had to go take care of her mom on the weekends? Now, when we make it safe for people to be their authentic selves at work, they feel a greater sense of commitment to that organization and to the work that they're doing. So I wanna give you a few examples of how you can make people feel valued, trusted, and able to be their authentic selves. First, in being valued. Now, this is the thing we hear most often in our, uh, in our surveys, when we're asking people about the sense of feeling valued, they want to know that their ideas were considered, even if they weren't ultimately adopted in the workplace. They want to know that they were grappled with, and even if they were ultimately rejected, that they were considered. When that happens, people feel like they will want to continue to work hard and contribute because maybe next time their idea will be adopted. But if it's rejected out of hands with no explanation, people ask themselves, is it worth the effort? Next, when it comes to feeling trusted, a lot of the support that we suggest comes from great resources like those put out by the Management Center. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization that supports other nonprofits by giving the kinds of traditional management trainings that uh, the for-profit sector would normally have and the nonprofit sector may have less access to. So when it comes to showing folks how to feel trusted in the workplace, uh, one thing that I would suggest is that we want people to be set up for success in their roles. So this sounds like pretty straightforward management 101, right? Uh, 
clarity on roles and goals, job descriptions, deliverables, uh, helping somebody with a, a new assignment by giving them an example before uh, they're asked to deliver on it. Uh, all of that seems pretty straightforward. And you can see there how a sense of feeling trusted and a sense of inclusion in the workplace rolls up to your business strategy. So that's another really important point. And finally, that sense of being one's authentic self at work. I would caution, we can't tell people, be your authentic self at work, right? That in 250 will get you a ride on the subway. What we need to do is to show people they can be safe at work, that no one will be punished for being their authentic selves at work, that we demonstrate empathy, that we show our, our care for our colleagues. And some of the ways we do that is by being discreet with sensitive information, if somebody shares something. And also as leaders, and perhaps most importantly, is holding people to account when it comes to expectations for behavior. So if somebody does make a remark that is inappropriate, it's a microaggression, it's bullying, it's harassment, that again, the buck stops with you. So you have to be the one to say that behavior is not tolerated here. That's a lot, right? But all of this redounds to your benefit in the organization, right? So I'm gonna tell you two or three quick more things and then we'll be jumping into, I know, questions. Um, in, in a few minutes, but I want to talk briefly with you about two things. One is about making meetings more inclusive. Um, I would love to see in the chat uh, if anyone has ever had the experience of being talked over uh, in a meeting or they say something and it falls flat and someone else says the same thing a minute later and it's widely adopted. Right? Wouldn't it be nice to eradicate that practice? <laughs> well, as business owners, you are in a fabulous position to ensure that that is not happening in your meetings. So let me pull this back up. I'm looking at our last takeaway, but we're going to be sharing some details about how you can have good meeting hygiene. Um, I know that sounds like a strange turn of phrase, but when we're talking about having good meeting hygiene, we're ensuring that people are able to share their ideas and not have someone else take credit for them. There's a scenario we use in our inclusive culture workshops about a man who talks over his female colleague and takes credit for her ideas, right? This is the scenario, I'll tell it to you. You're in a meeting where Lucia is proposing a solution to a vexing problem. Before she can finish, Nicholas cuts her off so he can further make Lucia's point. Lucia tries to speak up, but Nicholas chides her for interrupting. This scenario always, always results in people talking about how common and how frustrating this experience is. And the individuals who talk about this as their personal experience tend to identify as women. And, and it's not just anecdotal evidence to support that this happens. Research shows that women are often uncomfortable speaking up and are more than twice as likely to be interrupted in group dialogue, particularly in industries and organizations that are male dominated. Additionally, men from groups that are underrepresented feel similarly. So how do we deal with that? We can say something in the moment if we notice it, um, right? And as leaders, we need to be able to notice it. The more consistent approach and the one tied to an inclusive workplace culture is to set expectations ahead of time, right? Meetings have norms for better or worse. Organizations have norms for better and worse. And if our organizations hold meetings, whether or not participants are prepared or without an agenda, those are the norms for the organization. And they can be difficult to challenge in the moment. Uh, how many people have had the experience of showing up to a meeting, being ready and prepared, having done the work, and your colleagues haven't. It's a waste of your time. It's so frustrating. We can get ahead of these problems and ensure meetings are more productive and more inclusive 
by hitting the reset button and establishing new norms, ones that ensure good meeting hygiene. So we wanna make meetings shorter. If there are 30 minutes, shorten them to 25 and stick to them. If it's a meeting is booked for an hour, someone's booked right again in the next instant to start the next meeting at the next hour, right? Um, if a meeting is booked for that long a period, 50 minutes, as you see here, uh, or 45 minutes up on the program X discussion, uh, give people the first 10, 15 minutes to prepare for the meeting by reading whatever the relevant materials are or to take a break from the previous meeting. Next, every meeting should have an agenda. It outlines its purpose, outcome, topics, and time for each topic. If there isn't an agenda or if people aren't prepared or arrive late, teams should be comfortable with ending the meeting and reconvening. For meetings that don't have strong norms of inclusion, of ensuring everyone can talk, everyone, is, everyone shows up prepared, it's particularly important to have an MC. Now that person is responsible for the ground rules that we see here. These are our ground rules, the ones that you see up on the screen. We come prepared to talk. We encourage participation by all. We make space, we avoid interruption. Uh, we engage in active listening. Right. Now to have these ground rules in place, that makes it safer for everyone to participate and to know what the norms are. Committing to and creating these norms will make a big difference in terms of inclusion in the workplace. Finally, we're going to share these details and some information about making meetings more inclusive in the handouts. But what the last thing I want to share is about what not to do. Now, when we're talking about building an inclusive culture, we don't treat DEI like it's an extracurricular, like it's an affinity group. Um, even the significance and importance of employee resource groups are a small part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This isn't the non-committal um, participate if you want to work. This is much closer to your work that's connected to strategic planning. And for that, it needs the resources and the time that you would give it to achieve your strategic planning. Next, don't try and do everything right away. Uh, I know that we all as business leaders know that lesson from different aspects of our work. Uh, this is one of these places where slow and steady is absolutely crucial. But it also means that we can build on our past practices to do even better and that we can do work over time. And everyone should have that expectation that we're not going to achieve everything all at once. Connected to that is the idea that there isn't really a place where this work ends. Just as you would look at your strategic planning, there isn't a finish line where strategic planning is done for the business. It's work that's ongoing and changing and rewarding every time. So I hope that in this discussion, we have made it clear that this work is rewarding, it's connected to your business strategy, and it's something that is well worth your time. So thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you about it. Yeah, and uh, Audrey, that was uh, incredible. And I know we have a lot of questions that have come in before. And I know folks, I'm sure have questions um, as they watch live. And I, I wanna start with the first one that um, that I think a, a lot of people wrote in about. And many um, people on today are founders of companies, but we also I, you know, saw in the chat, there are a lot of people who work within um, organizations in different roles. So how is the role of a founder or an executive leader different in upholding a lot of these principles today than say a manager or an individual contributor? And how can we, um, as we maybe transition throughout our lives and careers into these different 
roles that we take on, make sure that we're upholding these values? I love that question. That's such a good one. So two things. When we are the person in, in charge, and I've been speaking to that role quite a lot, you can see you have to have to be the one who makes sure the resources are allocated, um, that you are doing what you say you will do when it comes to this work. When it comes to managers, I'm, I'm glad that that question came up because the research shows, we've included a link to research done at the uh, Wharton Business School that has found that when it comes to implementation of DEI, middle managers are the most important people. So if you wanna show that your organization will implement its leave policies, that, that somebody who should be getting a raise to, to bring someone into the, that correct salary band, you know, you're the, the leader who goes to bat for that. And actually, as an aside, I would really suggest people are subscribing to HBR's Women at Work uh, newsletter and their most recent series, which is how she got that raise, which is everything. Right. So middle managers are the ones that ensure policies are implemented correctly, that you're talking with teams about how inclusion is, is happening or not, and that has the ear of managers of the chain. Great. Well, I think a, a natural next question, and I know a lot of people on here are early stage founders. So when, when, the, when the feeling is, and we get this question no matter the topic, it's just me. How do I do this, mm -hmm. I, how do I be all the things that a big company is and support uh, these initiatives? So you're a founder, T tell us tell us the secret. I'll, I'll tell you when I was um, a true one woman show, the way I thought about this was, okay, I have the opportunity to hire vendors and contractors. How am I gonna do that? How do I expand my network? How do I ensure that there's a diversity of representation that reflects the communities that I'm working with? And that's a thing that I have power over, hiring for my CFO or uh, for the people who've designed um, our website, which is Toluca Studios, and they're fantastic, two women here in DC. Uh, but that's one way that you do it. And then doing your learning now, because you know you're in measure twice, cut once land right now. Yep. So you're doing that reading, you're learning that. And when you have the chance to implement it, you're going to feel so good. Mm -hmm. So a uh, follow-up question to that, and then I want to get to a question that just came in from Amelia in the Q&A box. But first, so you mentioned contractors and vendors. What are some of the maybe questions when you're interviewing or trying to find a contractor or a vendor to work with that I think have cl clued you into, does this person or organization uphold the same values I do? That's it. That's a great question. One thing that, that has changed over time is that people are putting this information right on their websites. These are our values. This is the work that we do. Uh, you're following them on Instagram. You'll know what they're talking about, what they're saying is important. Um, who are the people that they work with? That's another thing, is asking for recommendations. You, know, you always want to hire someone with a referral, and knowing who they've worked with can be an important indicator of their values. That's great. And so, so Amelia asked uh, in the Q&A box, you know, for don't try and do everything right away, how would you go about deciding what is that first thing to try and implement and do? Good question. So I think it depends on what stage you're at. Um, one thing that everyone can do right now is ensure that you're doing the learning. It's very personal. Uh, one thing we didn't talk a lot about is what happens when we screw up, because we will. Right, I microaggress. Um, I screw up. Um, how do you say you're sorry and learn and do better? How do you continue to inform yourself so that you're you're understanding the perspectives and experiences that are different from your own? Uh, and all of that is personally profound. And you'll know you're not outsourcing the work when when you're doing it, doing that part yourself first. And um, so how important is it to actually get certifications for diversity and inclusion, go through coursework versus maybe bringing somebody in from the outside? Like, what do you recommend? Uh, okay, um, good question. I thought about that myself because as a, a Tory Birch 
foundation fellow that one of the resources that was available to me was funding for education and I, I thought about that certification um, and what I, I found was that doing the work and I had the opportunity to do this work with clients was something more important than getting certification in a classroom setting. I already had the chance to be working on issues related to creating better policies uh, within an organization. And so what I would say uh, for individuals thinking about it is if you have the opportunity to do this work within a DEI committee or task force within an organization, that's an important uh, level of, of experience. Uh, experience outside of the workplace that goes to diversity, equity, and inclusion as well can be imparted in, in the work that you're doing. Uh, I, I don't think it's it's necessary to, to have that certification. It's a little bit of action speak louder, right? Yes. Um, and so what are, you know, for all of the early stage or prospective founders on today's call, what are some of the most practical things you would recommend in that really early stage of the company? So you're developing your brand DNA, maybe your company mission statement. Are there a couple thought starters that folks should consider um, when they're trying to bring uh, diversity, equity, inclusion right into the business from day one? Yes. I, I think the, the most important thing I would recommend is articulating with uh, your co-founders or for yourself, what are the values we're, we're seeking to uphold? What are our lines we won't cross? What, what are the things that we are going to prioritize? And when we do that, it, it helps us filter out things that we won't, we won't do. Um, and, and, and that might be the most important thing I would suggest. From there, and once you have people in, in place in, in any roles, is moving from values, which are the lofty things we uphold, to our norms and behaviors, the expectations that we set. We've heard about the things that go wrong in workplaces. I, I think of the example of a way and the luggage, and, and we, we heard about people being told to work night and day. And I, if we're clear about that, these are our values, this is what we do, that's one thing. But if we say that we are flexible in our hours or that we prioritize uh, holistic selves at work, that, that's different. And we have to be able to go from values to norms in implementation. So as, uh, and you, you started to hit on, as the organization grows, I'd imagine you're going back to revisit those values, but also um, as the organization grows, you're presumably doing um, inclusive hiring, you're taking steps towards growing and retaining a team. So what is the what is the one, I would say, the difference between just inclusive hiring to then retaining um, a team and supporting them once they're on board? It, it's huge. And what we actually recommend is, is laying that groundwork of the values and inclusive culture before we're talking about uh, hiring, because we don't want to bring people in and have them feel, I was... I'm brought here for something external, uh, for some aspect of my identity that's not related to the work. So when we're, we're seeking to retain the group that's, uh, that represents the, the communities we're seeking to serve, then we're thinking about how do we remove bias to the extent possible from our decision-making processes? How do we ensure that opportunities are made available to everyone? in the way that they need them to thrive, right? Who's getting the stretch assignments and who's not? Who's getting tapped for promotions and who's not? So something that I would say as, and, and I've seen this over and over within organizations that pile the money into programmatic growth and say, oh, we can't afford that human resources talent management function. And one thing that we say is you can pay for it now, you can pay for it later. So when you get it right, when you measure twice and cut once, when it comes to inclusive and equitable hiring and recruitment and retention practices, it's, it's a benefit down the road too. Absolutely. And I guess, I can I double back a little bit to inclusive hiring versus uh, diversity hiring? I think it's just something that is 
I think conflated culturally or people, you know, uh, maybe misdefine or talk about hiring in the wrong way. So can we just dig into that a little bit here for this group to make sure we're being clear on what does it really mean to be inclusive in your hiring? Oh, good question. So when we're hearing folks ask about diversity in hiring, I think most often about people trying to hit metrics and look at things that are fairly superficial. And when we're truly seeking to be inclusive in our hiring practices, we're looking to think about what, what do people, a variety of people, a vast variety of people need to thrive in this role? How do we ensure that we're getting a variety of applicants? Do we have uh, a pipeline that really shows that we are here to support employees with disabilities. For instance, you can feel safe in this workplace talking about disabilities and needs and accommodations because of ABCD. Um, you're making me think of my favorite, my all-time favorite job description ad, which I, I hope I can pull up for us in the next minute to, to show. But if you have another question, I'm going to come back yeah. to yeah, I, I have two questions and I might try and sneak a third in. So let's see if we can do this. Um, so when someone signed up for the webinar to, uh, today, they had said, I'm a BIPOC owned business. How can I make sure I'm supporting all of my staff? That, I love that question. That person gets the idea that inclusion is for everybody, by everybody. So one thing that I would say is really getting strong on your emotional intelligence skills. Because uh, one thing that I'm hearing in that question is, is the key that unlocks everything, which is what is the skill set I need to do this, not what words do I avoid or what do I, you know, what's on my do, do not list, yeah. right? It's a skill set that we need to be able to do this right. And we always rely on building empathy, self-regulation, self-awareness, social skill in doing this work. That's what I'd say. Well, I think that lends itself well into this next question, which is how can I make sure that the whole team is part of implementing inclusive strategies? So how do you bring everybody else along in that, I, I would say, journey to developing emotional intelligence? Great question. One thing that we do is you, you might have workshops. You might engage on topics like building psychological safety at work. Don't ever leave it at just that, that three hours, right, that you spend in a workshop, make sure that there are conversation starters for teams long down the road, that there is one-on-one -on -one topics for managers and their direct reports. And when your, your business is thriving and you've got that HR department that, that's doing the right things, what I would say is make sure that your values are things that people are being evaluated on in their performance reviews. It, and when they're living their values, living the values of the organization, they should be rewarded for it. And if they're not meeting those values, there need to be repercussions. So that's what I'd say. Yeah. Um, well, do you have that job description for us to take a look at? If not, it is okay. And I can yeah. ask a closing I question. I do. Can I show it? Yeah, let's do it. I think it would be so helpful for everyone on. Molly, where did it go? Oh no, multiple screens, I get it. Multiple screens. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, I'll tell you, not, not the same as, as an Instagram post, but this is, this is the idea, right? That you go into, um, you're looking at a job and the, the job description says, traditionally uh, women and some minority groups uh, have undervalued their own experiences in reviewing job descriptions. So if you're seeing this job description and you're interested in it, we encourage you to apply, despite whether you think you don't meet, you know, word for word, the, the job description uh, requirements. And I thought that was very powerful. That is incredibly powerful. And something I think we talk a lot, even in the fellowship or within foundation community is just that hesitation that often uh, culturally has been put upon women, people of color and, um, it's great to, on the upfront, uh, as a system, an institution putting out a job description, speak to, you know, encouraging folks to apply. Um, 
I am so conscious that we are at time and want to be cognizant of that, but I guess just a parting advice, what would you say to folks who are battling maybe naysayers on, um, on all of these topics, any advice so that we can all push forward? You know, in, you know this is the right thing to do. And somebody telling you that it's not, you know, stick with your gut that tells you that, that this is important work to do and, and you'll feel like it's worth it every time. Amazing. Well, Andre, I cannot thank you enough for being here with us today, for sharing your expertise. Um, and for everyone who tuned in, uh, we are so grateful for your time and participation in our community. Um, 